Um, so you're probably wondering why an undergraduate, such as myself, is talking about something that's clearly out of my field of expertise. Um, well, <laughs> you'd be correct in wondering that. Uh, it, it's something that I've been really interested in. Uh, however, obviously, it's not something that I've studied before, so that's why I went out and I spoke to two experts in the field, uh, one of them being Dr. Anthony G. Varajan from NASA, and the other being Jonathan Clark from um, the Baylor College of Medicine Space Medicine Department. And they were both really gracious enough to pass on a lot of education materials and really help me build this talk for you all today. So what is medicine on the final frontier? What is space medicine? Uh, there's really no one single definition, but the one that I really liked was uh, medical science that is concerned with the biological, physiological, and psychological effects of space flight on humans. So it's not just medicine in space, it's not just the hands-on like surgical stuff. While that is part of this, this is actually an all-encompassing field that explores all of the effects that space has on man. The main objectives of this field are to, one, discover how well and how long humans can survive in space. The second is to discover how fast people can adapt to Earth's environment after first having adapted to space. Uh, because this field contains so much information that I can, uh, you know, it's way too much to cover in a 15 minute talk, I'll be focusing on that first objective of space uh, biological effects on man. So before embarking on this long journey uh, up into space, I'd like to bring us up to speed on just the history behind uh, this field. So technically space medicine actually began before the first man flight. Uh, with a lot of medical spin-offs that came from uh, some of the research technologies put out by NASA. It didn't take on a concrete form that we now associate with space medicine until later during the space shuttle era when NASA and a few other space uh, agencies started to work on medical tools that could actually be used on board specifically for the crew um, during uh, these manned missions. And then later, beginning in 1998, uh, began international work uh, that put together what is now probably man's greatest achievement, the International Space Station. This is, this is literally something out of a science fiction movie from the 50s. It is a science vessel that's floating in space at all times and it's always manned. And there's this incredible amount of research that's going on up there and that's some of what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So this is a little bit cheesy, so bear with me, but imagine that you're all astronauts and you're, you're strapped to your, your chair in a cockpit of a space shuttle that's getting ready for, for takeoff. Uh, <laughs> so uh, upon takeoff, uh, this is really where the space medicine begins. Uh, you're being rocketed upward at incredible, incredible speeds and these G-forces are gonna do things that can be really scary. It's, it's gonna make you feel like you're being flattened, it's gonna be difficult to breathe. Uh, it's going to make you, some of you pass out because the blood just rushes to the back of your skull. But after it kind of, it, it appears to slow down and then you see this beautiful horizon over, um, uh, over the earth and you now dock the International Space Station, which looks like something like this from the outside. And on the inside, if you're researchers, you're probably working in a module that looks something like this. So some of the main life support systems that you should familiarize yourself with are the carbon dioxide removal, um, waste disposal, and food supply, among a bunch of other systems like fire safety. So these all are the mechanical things that ensure the safety and the well-being of the crew. Now in the first few days in space, uh, things can, can feel a little bit weird. Uh, in the first day or two, you're, you're going to feel the fluid shift from the, from the bottom of your body, from your legs, up into your torso and your head. So your face gets all swollen and puffy. You're going to be completely disoriented because your organs that allow you to have a sense of balance down here on Earth just don't really work that well in space. So down is up and up is down. And uh, <laughs> you might feel a little bit of motion sickness from that sudden change in G-forces. And these are all characteristic of what's known as space adaptation syndrome. Now, uh, after that first uh, phase, uh, most astronauts get used to that, and there's also uh, medication available to help alleviate some of those symptoms. You now have to tackle basically learning how to do everything that you do down here on Earth uh, up in space. Eating, hygiene, and sleeping are completely different up there, but I won't go into too much detail, but needless to say, it's really, really hard. 
So now this brings me to the main items I'm going to be exploring in this talk, and it's the numerous assaults that space travel uh, places on the human body. This includes altered gravity, space radiation, hostile environments, distance from Earth, and just the sheer isolation. So interestingly, men and women uh, actually witness different physiological changes in space. Uh, I know this is a very detailed diagram, but the main takeaway here is basically that in all the following slides, keep in mind that men and women astronauts uh, are affected differently. So altered gravity. Muscle atrophy and bone loss are probably the ones that you're most familiar with. Uh, down here on Earth, when you do everything from uh, walking uh, to, to sitting upright in your chair, the muscles and bones in your body are working together uh, to fight against the force of gravity. But up in space, uh, they have to work a lot less to, to accomplish those same tasks. And your body is really good at only inputting just the right amount of energy uh, to get what it needs to, so it invests less into that, you begin to lose mass, and this can affect your performance, uh, and it can actually increase the risk for injuries, like fracture. For similar reasons, uh, your heart also begins to have problems. So because your heart doesn't have to pump nearly as hard to get the blood around your body, it'll also start to weaken. And it can start to have these really odd rhythms. Um, this is an actual electrocardiograph from an astronaut who's, who sustained this really weird uh, ventricular tachycardial episode, where basically a part of his heart just started to quiver for 10 seconds completely out of the blue. Uh, he was fine, but this is a real cause for concern because now this suggests that maybe sudden cardiac arrest could be uh, a very real risk in space. Now remember how I told you how the fluid shifts from your legs up into your head? This results in what's, what's known as uh, increased intracranial pressure. So basically what that is, is there's more fluid in your head and that, that really it just presses on your eyeballs and your nerves to result in vision issues and can potentially result in permanent vision loss, which, is, uh, which would obviously be completely catastrophic to, a, uh, to the success of a mission. Kidney damage is an interesting uh, thing that arises in space, and this comes from basically the limited diet astronauts have and also the limited access they have to uh, water. So they um, generally, their diet it consists more, most of animal protein, and they don't hydrate as much, which is a perfect environment for these stones to form. And if they dislodge, it can cause a lot of pain, and it's very, very hard to treat. Immune function loss is something that's only recently been discovered, and it's something that isn't very well studied. Uh, but of course, an increased risk for infection up in space is a cause, a cause for huge concern. So moving on. NASA has done a lot of work to combat some of these issues, but the solutions we have right now are not perfect, though they alleviate some of the issues. So for muscle atrophy, bone loss, and cardiac issues, the main things astronauts can really do now is rigorous exercise. So of course, uh, dumbbells and treadmills don't really work the same way up in space than they do down here on Earth, so engineers have created these very ingenious devices that take advantage of tension and like vacuum action to allow these astronauts to work out. So this, uh, it doesn't prevent damage, but it delays it, which is, I guess, good enough for now. Kidney damage uh, can be alleviated by basically avoiding foods high in oxalates, uh, which is present in your leafy greens and chocolate, and high-fat um, high foods as well. And to increase hydration, if possible, to basically invest in greater water supply. The vision issues and immune function, however, that is something that uh, there is really no easy answer to right now, and research is being done on that to tackle this issue. Now, radiation. Radiation is basically, it refers to these really high energy particles that are everywhere, and uh, they can cause some serious harm. And the scary thing is, these, uh, these, these radiation particles are often so high in energy that even these astronauts being in this seemingly enclosed environment are just bombarded with this, with this radiation, which comes from uh, particles trapped in the magnetic field, solar flares, as well as galactic cosmic radiation. So this comes from faraway galaxies. So this penetrates the aircraft and it causes DNA damage. Uh, this can have long lasting effects like increased risk for cancer, accelerated aging, and recently discovered also damage to the central nervous system. There's been a lot of investment into finding some kind of materials that can offer protection, and some of this exists, but of course it's not, it's not good enough yet, and it's also very expensive to produce and send there. Some more research is being done on that to solve that problem. 
Now moving on to the hostile environments. So carbon dioxide uh, is of course toxic even here down on Earth, but oxygen is another thing that can be toxic. And in these artificial environments, these gases are usually present at different concentrations than there are in the air that we breathe. And switching from these environments can uh, increase the risk of uh, all these symptoms from head to toe, from um, vision issues to, to motor issues. Uh, basically, the, the best thing to do is basically to, to limit that. Um, chemical exposure is something uh, that any astronaut will have to deal with, especially if lunar missions and uh, Mars missions are to happen in the future. Uh, notably, these dust particles, which are basically ubiquitous on the Moon and, and on Mars, these are uh, usually coated in a lot of very reactive elements that if astronauts come into contact with in their skin or in their lungs can be very, very damaging. And decompression sickness, if any of you are divers, uh, is referred to as the bends commonly. And this uh, basically it describes uh, a uh, pressure shift that results in nitrogen basically bubbling out of your blood and resulting in these really, really nasty symptoms and pain. Um, and astronauts have to deal with that basically with every spacewalk. That's a risk. So to tackle carbon dioxide and oxygen toxicity, the best thing that astronauts can do right now is to just very closely monitor uh, these gases and make sure that they're not changing environment very frequently. It's not the best solution, but that's the solution we have right now. Chemical exposure is the same thing. It, it, it seems like a, a silly way to go about it, but really the best way to deal with that is to either avoid unnecessary exposure or in the future build uh, filters that can better help uh, protect astronauts from these harms. More research is being done exactly into that. And decompression sickness, there are some things that are being done right now to basically uh, do a nitrogen purge, which is where an astronaut sits in a chamber that is very, very high in pressure and to just push out all of the nitrogen from their body before doing like a spacewalk. But usually that environment is high in oxygen and then that results in oxygen toxicity, so it's a very complex problem. So research is also being done into that to maybe find a solution. Uh, pressurizing the helmet and the, uh, and the suit differentially is something that people are looking into as, as a potential solution. Now, uh, this last one you probably wouldn't have thought would be uh, under this, this umbrella term of space medicine, but it's probably the ultimate challenge. Psychological damage. So even if humans were somehow completely invulnerable to all of the hazards I just mentioned, the main thing they will have to combat is just the isolation and just the extended uh, stay away from home. Imagine being really, really far away from home uh, your friends, your family, being just cramped and confined in this tin can with space food and a crummy sleep cycle and with just this high stress of uh, having the mission uh, success on your shoulders and also just the cherry on top like you could die in a second. <laughs> so that can really, uh, it can really wear down on your psyche uh, over several months or several years. So uh, there's actually an entire field uh, within space medicine referred to as space psychology that, that looks at exactly that. And um, while there isn't any easy answer, especially with it being sort of a social science, uh, NASA has done a lot of research and they've developed these really rigorous training programs to basically increase the resilience of its crew and to uh, really get along better. So they select personalities that work well together in, in this very, very high stress environment. And these are ways right now uh, that agencies uh, around the world can mitigate some of those issues uh, such as behavioral problems or uh, thoughts of suicide. So to place everything in context, imagine all these hazards but many thousands of miles from home uh, completely out of help's reach. So this really solidifies the, uh, the need for a dedicated medical staff basically to have a self-sufficient group up in space. How it's done now is usually through telecommunication However, this isn't feasible if um, they're really, really far from Earth because radio takes time to get from where they are to Earth. So a, a delay in time, you know, that increase in, in delay can delay treatment and can result in death. So <laughs> uh, a Mars mission is something that we've all been wondering about. It's something that's, I feel like I see uh, a, new art, a news article about almost every single week. 
And it's not far from fiction. It is something that scientists are actually working on right now. The doctor that I spoke with, Dr. Uh, Jeevrajan, is working on this right now to make this mission a reality. However, there are a lot of things that we need to consider, notably just the sheer amount of time that this would take, not to mention the host of other problems. Assuming that uh, a flight leaves from Earth, it would take about six months to get to Mars, even at the closest points. And operations would take about 18 months, which includes the time that they have to wait for Earth and Mars to come back close enough to do a flight back, which would add another six months, which adds to about two and a half years, which is an unbelievably long time right now. All those hazards that I just mentioned, these were discovered in a much, much smaller uh, time span. So this is, this is a really daunting task. So the main challenge is you know, for us to ensure that these men and women that uh, we send can safely return home without any long-lasting damage. Uh, however, I mean, it, it really seems like we've hit this roadblock with this never-ending list of problems. And I haven't even mentioned all of them. Now, I didn't really want to end on a gloomy note, um, but it's important to acknowledge that this is, this is a long road. This is a very daunting task. And how can I give a talk here at Rice about space without quoting John F. Kennedy, uh, who right here at Rice in 1962 gave his, fa uh, his famous speech that inspired millions of people to choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So it's those guiding words, that spirit, that I think really could allow us to continue uh, to overcome these almost infinite problems and to basically push the envelope and continue making science fiction nonfiction. Thank you.